Thank you for joining us today for a town hall discussion with Congressman Adam Smith. Today's event will be a great opportunity to have a conversation about the threats facing our environment and what steps we can take to promote a healthier planet. My name is Dirk, and I'll be your moderator. Just a few housekeeping items to go through before we bring Congressman Smith on the line. If you would like to ask a question during today's discussion and you're joining via phone, please press star 3 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. If you're joining through Congressman Smith's website or Facebook page, you can enter your questions in the chat box, or you can call 833-305-1708 to join over the phone. Again, 833-305-1708 to join over the phone, and to enter that question queue, just press star 3. Now, during this call, you can also get signed up for the Congressman's e-newsletter by simply pressing star 6 on your telephone keypad. Now, if you have personal inquiries or specific cases, updates on your applications or other related matters, please reach out to Congressman Smith's office using his website, adamsmith.house.gov forward slash contact. Now, before we turn to questions, we'll hear opening remarks from Congressman Smith. Congressman, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you all uh, for participating in the call this evening. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, mostly, I want to hear from you about what issues or concerns you have or um, things you want to see me working on around the environment. But the purpose of this call, as the uh, moderator mentioned, was to discuss um, environmental policy, threats to the environment at the top of that list. And obviously, the single biggest issue we face um, well, the single biggest issue we face, period, with regards to the planet, but certainly the single biggest issue we face environmentally uh, is the threat of climate change and the impact of burning fossil fuels on climate change. And the policy that I feel we need to pursue is to get us off of fossil fuels and get us a clean, efficient uh, energy future. Now, I think the good news here is uh, we have the technology, I believe. We have the ability to get to this clean energy future, but we have to make a bigger commitment to get there. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed earlier this year helps in some regard. There's a lot of money in there to uh, help with electric vehicles, building electric charging stations, um, huge investment in public transportation uh, in a move towards making that public transportation also to be clean energy, having all electric uh, buses, for instance. So we've made some investments, but we have not made nearly enough. We have to get to the point where we can have the energy we need without relying on fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, and oil. Um, and we need to make a bigger investment going forward. And I think the key to this is to invest in those alternative sources of energy. Um, certainly, we've seen a lot of improvement in areas like wind and solar. It's become much cheaper, um, you know, more affordable, more able to be generated and be a bigger part of our, our energy future. Uh, but we also have to invest more in battery technology, in transmission technology. So much of our energy is lost after it is generated that it requires us to use more. Energy efficiency is another great way to get us to a cleaner energy future. Um, if we can get more out of the energy we use, then we have to generate less of it. And then we, we have to make those investments in breakthrough technologies, potentially fusion. Um, there was a major advancement made just a few months ago uh, in the UK on fusion, which could give us a, a huge uh, boost in getting to the energy future we need. Um, hydrogen energy, uh, non-gaseous hydrogen, hydrogen in particular. We need to make those investments to get to those breakthrough technologies so that we can move off of our reliance on fossil fuels. Because the problem is pe people need energy. Um, I am supportive of a cap and trade system. I am supportive of a carbon tax. You know, if, if we drive up the cost of carbon, then that incentivizes using other technologies, other cleaner burning technologies. But we're not going to get there unless we have reasonable alternatives. People will oppose increasing the cost of energy if they don't have a future. Because an increase in the cost of energy has a particularly negative impact on lower income folks, uh, on people who can't afford it if they're, they're, the cost to heat their home or to fuel up their car goes up. We need to make sure that clean energy future is there. So if we're going to raise money um, through a carbon tax or through a cap and trade system, we need to make sure that that money goes back into the people uh, who can least afford it so that they're made whole. 
then we can begin to build the political support we need to get to a clean energy future. Now, certainly climate change isn't the only environmental issue. Clean air and clean water continue to be crucial. They are connected, of course, because the fewer fossil fuels we burn, the better protected both our air and water is going to be. But here locally, we need to pay attention to things like Puget Sound, um, which has been so heavily polluted in uh, recent decades. Uh, there is a project underway working with local communities to try to clean that up, reduce stormwater runoff, um, deal with the impacts of that. Uh, but we need to focus on clean air and clean water as well. I am disappointed that we weren't able to pass the Build Back Better bill. The Build Back Better bill had somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 billion in money set aside to make precisely those investments um, in clean energy, transmission, battery technology that we need to get to where we need to go. Um, it's not done yet. Um, we're still in conversation on that issue. But I think it's one of the best things we could do to get us to a better environmental future. I also think that the United States needs to be a global leader. Obviously, you know, the U.S. alone uh, cannot solve the climate energy problem we have. We need all nations of the world working together on this problem. Um, I am pleased that President Biden wanted to get us back into the Paris Climate Accord. Um, I'm pleased that we had the, the climate summit that was held uh, in Scotland, uh, gosh, I forget now, six months ago, it seems, um, to begin that discussion, because we have to work together as a planet. Um, everyone has an impact on the environment. Everybody has an impact on climate change. The U.S. needs to be a leader in addressing the issue. And I guess I'll just close by saying one of the biggest things we need to do is we need to get past this debate of whether or not climate change is a thing. We still have to deal with that. There are many people who say it doesn't matter. You can burn as many fossil fuels as you want and everything will be fine. It will very much not be fine. And the way I always like to sum it up is digging up fossil fuels from below the ground, whether you're talking coal, natural gas, or oil, digging it up and burning it is bad for life. It pollutes the air and it pollutes the water. And also the evidence shows that it contributes to the warming of the planet, uh, which makes the planet or puts the planet on a path to being uninhabitable. You know, we, we want to preserve life on Earth. To do that, we need to make this investment. And again, I guess I'll, I'll close where I started. I'm optimistic. We have the technology. We have the ability to do this. If we make the investment, uh, if we show the commitment to developing a clean energy future, I'm 100% certain that we can do it. But if we continue to deny that it's an issue and continue to fail to make the investments to make that transmission, transition, uh, we will all pay a horrible price for that. So we're, we've made some progress in some areas, a lot more work to do. I'm happy to discuss the details with you and answer to your questions. Thank you very much, Congressman. Now, before we get into the Q&A, I would like to remind everybody you can join the Congressman's e-newsletter by pressing star six on your telephone keypad right now. Again, press star six to join the Congressman's weekly e-newsletter. Now, if you've got a question you'd like to ask, all you need to do is press star three to enter the question queue. Again, if you've got a question you'd like to ask live on this call, please press star three now. Now, earlier we gave people an opportunity to uh, send in questions for this Q&A segment of this town hall. And uh, we've got a few of them that I'd like to start out with. So, Congressman, this is a two-part question. Uh, what steps will you take to help phase out fossil fuels quickly? And what steps will you take to push oil companies to reinvest in renewable energy? Well, I think that the biggest thing we have to do is make make the investment through the government in, in that in those renewable sources of energy, um, and you know, to, as we develop those technologies, then you know that that's what gives us the alternative. We can't go to people and say, "Please just stop heating your house. Please just stop driving your car." Um, we have to go to people and say, "Here's a better way to do it." Um, so, making that investment in an electricity future, I mean, at that point, energy companies. You know, they, they can make money that way just as easily as they can make money off of fossil fuels. Make those investments. The other thing that I do support is, as I said, I, I support, you know, we had, a, we had a cap and trade vote back in Congress in 2009, which I supported, passed the House, did not pass the Senate. I've also I supported the carbon tax that we had on the ballot um, here in the state of Washington a few years back, a couple years back now, I think it was. It failed. So if we drive up the costs of carbon fuel, um, then that incentivizes moving towards cleaner burning energy. But I think the, the questioner is absolutely right. We need to incentivize the private sector to make these investments. 
um, and that includes our, our energy companies. We need to you know give the tax credits. I mean, look, the, the fossil fuel industry has about 150, almost 175 year head start now in terms of having an infrastructure built to facilitate it. Um, we have subsidized all manner of different um, aspects of the fossil fuel industry, from pipelines to di digging and drilling to tax credits of one kind or another. And they've built up this incredible infrastructure that makes it easy to run. We need to build up an infrastructure for electric vehicles and clean burning fuels. And that's, you know, transmission, that's battery storage, that's generation, that's all pieces of it. Make that investment and then we can make that more profitable than fossil fuels. And that's the way to get the investments that we need. So our next question, what are you doing at the local and federal level to tackle noise pollution, sir? Yeah, I mean, that biggest issue that it comes in my area is with SeaTac Airport. Um, and we are working with our communities around the airport, with the airport itself, with the Port of Seattle, which runs the airport, and the FAA. Um, number one, we would like to fully fund the noise mitigation efforts for the communities around there, get better studies on the impact of noise, and make sure that people have access to the uh, support they need to build noise mitigation, um, to insulate their houses. Also, you know, when it comes to airline travel, uh, we could get um, quieter airplanes as well. I will say we've, we've made a ton of progress in that. I'm old enough to remember what it sounded like to hear a 727 take off from SeaTac Airport. Uh, and trust me, it was a lot louder than what's taken off now. So that is an improvement, but more needs to be done. So we're working with the airport communities to try and control that. Thank you very much. Our next question uh, deals with the military. And it's a rather long question, and here it goes. I understand that the U.S. military, in total, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the country. What steps is the military taking to transform to clean renewable energy sources and reduce emissions and pollution? Yeah, the Department of Defense is, I think, just about the largest entity we have uh, in the country. So, yes, um, they consume a lot of fuel. We're actually taking a number of steps. Now, it's important to say that we sadly had a four-year break in all of this during the Trump presidency um, because President Trump did not believe in climate change and not believe in making an effort to get us off of fossil fuels. So a lot of the programs that were started under the Obama administration and others um, to move towards greater efficiency within the Pentagon uh, were stalled during the Trump administration. They've been restarted now. And look, I mean, it's everything from the military bases that are run getting them to zero net emissions, which is now the set goal from the uh, defense bill that we've passed by 2035 to get to zero net emissions, building a more clean energy friendly infrastructure across the board as you know they build out and retrofit all of the military bases to making investments in green technology. President Obama had the, the great green fleet, which was the vision of being able to fuel our, our uh, ships in the Navy with biofuels, uh, not having to rely on fossil fuels. So a lot of investments are being made within the Department of Defense to better develop those energy technologies to get to that point that I talked about. Make the investment so that wind, solar, biofuels, hydrogen, um, potentially nuclear, they are working on smaller nuclear reactors, which I we realize is controversial, but it's also potentially a, a huge source of clean burning energy, to basically make the investments to develop the technology. Now, this will certainly help with the military, as uh, the moderator mentions in the question. Uh, military is a huge consumer of fuel, so if the military is able to get to a cleaner energy future, then that's great. But it is also a way to make investments in these technology that can be, then be used in the private sector as well. Uh, so it's a win-win in my view. And as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, it's one of the biggest issues that we're pushing. Um, we actually passed in the defense bill a couple of years back the statement that climate change was a threat to our national security and needs to be addressed. So we're trying to get DOD to be a leader in getting us to a clean energy future. All right, looks like we've got a lot of questions uh, for you here with callers, so we're going to segue to the phone. As a reminder, if you have a question you'd like to ask, all you need to do is press star 3 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. And our first question comes from Joe in Renton. We've got uh, Joe on the line live. Joe, welcome 
You're live with Congressman Smith. What is your question? Hi, uh, hi, Congressman. Uh, thank you for holding this town hall. Um, hey, Joe. This is uh, related to nuclear energy. Um, I guess uh, you mentioned fusion and modular reactors, um, and but how much is the government uh, really investing in not just breakthrough nuclear technology, uh, but in um, existing technologies that will help us to get to a carbon free energy in like the medium term, which I think is you know, difficult to impossible without nuclear energy. Yeah, not as much as it should, in my view. Um, as you know, this has been a controversial issue, but the truth is, particularly in recent years, there's been a number of breakthroughs. I mean, look, the positives of nuclear energy are it's, you know, as you mentioned, it's clean burning and it has, you know, but a ton of potential in terms of output. Um, the negatives are number one, the waste, and number two, the risk. But we have come up with technologies that can mitigate that, that can reduce the amount of waste that is generated and also create a safer nuclear reactor. We should make those investments. And you know, eventually this is a public policy choice. The public has to get to the point where they're comfortable with it in order to accept it. Um, but I think at a minimum, we should be making the investment to be able to develop the best possible nuclear technology uh, so that the public can make that choice. I know um, Bill Gates, I forget the name of the company, he's got a company that's develop that developed a smaller nuclear reactor that is less waste, less risk, um, and we're trying to get some pilot projects out for that. But I think we need to make that investment. Look, if we are serious about climate change, um, it's a place where we got to invest the money, and there's not a guarantee. Um, you're not, everyone's not going to be a winner, but if you make investments, if you really go at fusion, if you go at hydrogen, if you go at nuclear and you at biofuels and you try to develop the technology that is there, that gives you the best chance to get there. And nuclear has to be part of that equation, in my opinion. All right, Congressman, our next question comes from David. David, you're live on the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, Congressman. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Not doing well. I wanted to ask you a question regarding the infrastructure bill that would be needed to support all this electric energy to support the, all the electric vehicles. My father worked for Puget Sound Energy for 40 years, and I, we've had a lot of talks about how to build the infrastructure. Infrastructure is such a big need, and it would take, from his estimation, as an engineer for Puget Sound Energy years to build and have the support then to go where we could have, say, 70% electrified vehicles. And with Jay Inslee signing the bill, it says by 2030 that no more gas burning vehicles will be registered in the state. What are your thoughts on this? How are we going to get there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I, I will say that at having aspirations, you, you can get there faster than you think you do if you place the proper incentives in place. And I, I remember when we were dealing with the, the ozone layer problem and the impact of chlorofluorocarbons, and there was a huge push um, to get rid of these and, you know, stop that. And everyone, not everyone, sorry, the industry screamed bloody murder about it. You can't do it. You're not going to get there. You're pushing us too fast, blah, blah, blah. And I forget the exact details, but long story short, the law was passed and they got there in, in half the time that they thought they were going to get there. So I understand that, you know, physics is physics and it doesn't change. And, you know, you have certain limitations in terms of how you can get there. But I also believe that if you make the investment and make the commitment, you know, we're inventing things all the time that we didn't, we didn't anticipate, obviously. That's why it's called an invention. So I think we make the investment, we, we can get there, there more quickly. Can we get there by the date that Jay Inslee set in that law? I don't know, but I certainly know that we should set the goal. And if as we get closer, we see problems, well, then we can we can think about it and we can adjust. Um, but if we made that investment, again, the thing I always come back to is the infrastructure that we've built for the fossil fuel industry. You know, 175 years we've been building that um, slowly, but at great expense. And it's all out there. If we can build that infrastructure for electric vehicles, if we can build the charging stations and also as we make advancements in the generation of that electricity, that makes it easier too battery technology, improving that. And I know right now there are some severe limitations on that, 
Uh, but you never know when the next breakthrough is coming. So I think we have to set high, ambitious goals uh, and work towards them. And look, you know, you come back down to it. When you talk about climate change and the impact on the planet, it's not going to be easy. It is going to require change. And in some cases, it's going to be costly. I'm not going to pretend that there's a huge win-win here where nobody winds up paying anything more. But if you're talking about the survival of the planet, it's worth taking a few chances and making the investment and pushing the envelope is basically the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you're being willing to be open about nuclear is a very positive because my father has said that nuclear is the key to making this happen and having the ability to put in all the stations to charge will take a lot of po a huge power grid to make that happen and we can do it it's just going to take a lot of time and a lot of money yeah no and 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 the improvements and i'm glad you mentioned the power grid i mean transmission is such a huge part of this transmission and storage and i don't know what the stats are now but there's a time when it's like half of all the the energy that the sorry half of all the electricity that we generate goes to waste between the time it's generated and the time we use it um and i know that's not <laughs> that's not like you know fixing a light bulb Sorry, uh, but it's, you know, it's difficult. But if we could do it, imagine if that number was a third instead of half, you know, then all of a sudden you're making use of a lot of electricity and there's studies going on and people um, inventing new technologies and looking at this problem all the time. We got, we got a lot of smart people. We got a lot of resources. We got a big problem. We got to bring all those together and find a solution. All right, our next caller is Robert, who has a question. Robert, you're live on the call with Congressman Smith. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, Robert. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you're live on the call. Oh, okay. Hi, Congressman. I really enjoy, enjoy listening to you and the ideas that you have and the support you have for the program. I'm a little bit twixt in between as to what's going on with Ukraine, us cutting back, uh, of course, as it should be, uh, the oil reserves that we're getting from Russia. Uh, but we're also facing with uh, high energy costs at this time. And I know we need to move forward on clean energy. I support it 100 percent as everything that you've indicated. My concern is what are we doing parallel to that to meet the country's energy needs in the short term while we are still trying to convert over to clean energy, which is going to take a little bit of time and help reduce the burden that's being placed currently on average citizens who live paycheck to paycheck and uh, with these high costs of energy. So I will throw that question over to you and I appreciate your response. Yeah. No, that is the question on, on, on this issue that I think all politicians need to think about. And I, I know the moral imperative here. I've stated the moral imperative a couple of times earlier that, you know, if the preservation of the planet is dependent upon us getting, getting you know, fossil fuels out of our system, then we simply have to do it. And that's great. But in my experience, and I have extensive experience in politics, people are more short term, more practical. Um, and they're going to be concerned about what their energy costs are. They're going to be concerned about what you just exactly described. Am I going to be able to fill up my car? Am I going to be able to get to work? Um, am I going to be able to heat my home and meet my energy needs in the short term? And w we have to be able to, to confront that issue. You got to do both. You got to develop the clean energy future and you have to not bankrupt people in the process. I think we can do it. Um, I think we can particularly target low income communities, people who are economically struggling. Um, that's why I've always supported the idea on the carbon. If we, if we do a carbon tax, if we raise money from carbon, the money raised from that ought to go back to low income communities to make sure that they can afford um, energy. So I think that that's a way to get after it. Uh, but you correctly state the problem. Uh, we have to deal with it in the short term and the long term. I will say, and this is not widely understood, but right now today, we are generating more um, fossil fuels in the United States of America than we ever have before. I know there's this impression that somehow Joe Biden has shut down all drilling and all generation of fossil fuels. Not the case. Um, we are still generating particularly natural gas, but oil and even some coal as well. So 
it's out there. But the point that I always like to make whenever we run into a situation like we're now with Putin or where we used to historically be with the Middle East, um, when we were at the mercy of OPEC and people would say, well, look, that's why we've got to generate all of our own um, sources of energy. We have to generate all of our own oil and coal and natural gas. It's a global market. So even if we are generating enough locally um, to meet our needs in the United States, the, the people drilling it and bringing it up, they're going to sell it on the global market. And if the price is going up, then we're going to be at the mercy of that price. Now, if we generate more, that's greater supply. Being Adam Smith, I understand the basic supply and demand curve here. If you have more supply, that will help keep the price down. But if you are dependent upon fossil fuels, then you are dependent upon fossil fuels. If you want to be energy independent, then give yourself more options. Don't be dependent upon fossil fuels because Russia's got them, Venezuela's got them, Iran, Saudi Arabia. And as long as they're generating them, if that's the driving force behind the energy economy, then to some degree, we are going to have to be relying on them. Now, when the day comes that when you come pulling up to the pump and it's five bucks a gallon, and you can go, nope, I'm not doing that. I've got an electric vehicle. I'm going to get my electricity from this source over here that's cheaper, uh, that's generating it through either nuclear or you know, hydrogen or better you know, wind and solar power that has generated the electricity. When the day comes that you have that option of choosing a source of fuel different than a fossil fuel, that's the day that we will be less dependent upon places like Russia and they will be less able to hold us hostage. That's why that's the future we've got to get to. Well, I agree 100%. What we're finding out, though, is you start looking at the cost of electric vehicles, despite uh, tax credits and everything, the average person is looking at it and going, oh, my God, you got to be kidding. Uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars for some of these electric vehicles, and that gets way out of the uh, purview of most people's income and ability to even finance that kind of uh, debt to incorporate and be part of that process. So how do yeah. we get over those hurdles? Well, to begin with, it doesn't have to be a Tesla. Um, you know, they, they, there can be more affordable electric vehicles, but that's part of it too. I mean, you've got to get to the point where the electric vehicles are more affordable and you've got to incentivize that and you've got to, you know, move to develop that technology. Um, you know, uh, that, you know, you've got to look at the entire chain here. You know, you're right. If you, if we, let's say we could build all the electrical stations that we need, let's say that we could generate all the electricity that we need. And yet you couldn't, you couldn't get a car for less than $70,000. That's not going to get us there. You know, we've got to figure out how, how to build them cheaper and better. But historically, when you look at technology, it gets cheaper and better. How much? I don't know, but you know the computer I'm staring at. I remember what I paid for the first computer I ever bought. Um, I pay less now for a vastly more effective machine um, because the investments were made and we figured it out. But I think I think your your thinking is exactly right. You got to look at every little piece of it. You know, you, if if you're not hitting it, if you're just saying again, if you're just telling people this is a moral imperative, you know, you should buy an electric vehicle, and the people go, yeah, I don't have seventy thousand dollars. So moral imperative or not, I can't do it. You got to figure out how to help people get there. Our next question comes from Wendy, who's on the line with us now. Wendy, welcome. What is your question for the congressman? Um, <clears throat> good evening, congressman. Um, I first want to um, encourage all everyone listening to this phone call to read Rachel Maddow's book, Blowout, and ask you what the Democratic Party is doing to alleviate the fear of inflation um, among the general population, mostly related to out-of-pocket expenses for gasoline and um, food, um, that where the shipping costs are so high because of the price gouging of the oil companies. I'm afraid yeah, no, it, that Congress may turn over, and I don't want that to happen. Yeah. No, in, inflation is definitely a major pressure point right now. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, I've I've been around long enough that as we talked about inflation, um, you know, we haven't had it for a very long time. I mean, when I first went onto the market to, to buy a house when I was in my mid-20s, you know, interest rates were between 7 and 10 percent. 
Um, and I, of course, I remember back when, when my father was, was, you know, buying a house in the late seventies, early eighties, well, actually bought the house before then, but I remember what interest rates were in the late seventies and early eighties. And they were like 18%. Um, and then we got down low to, you know, what, what it was now, gosh, I, you know, bought my house and financed it with a 3% loan, uh, 10 years ago. And it kept, kept going and going and going. And we just sort of got to the point, well, I guess inflation's always low. Well, no, it's not. Um, it can go up and you have to be careful about the policies you implement to get there. Now, as you've mentioned, much of this is being driven by fuel prices. It is number one with a bullet in terms of what's going up. And understand that fuel prices, certainly they drive the family budget, but they also drive the food budget because the people growing the food and shipping the food and selling the food, they got to get it there. And the higher the energy costs are, the more that's going to go up. Same with everything that you're, you're, you're going to ship and move around. Energy drives so much of this. So again, I'll come back to my answer to your previous questioner. You know, get to the point where you have an alternative to simply paying for the fossil, whatever the fossil fuel price is. That will drive up the supply of energy and get those prices down under control. I will also say something that is not popular, I understand, but I've been saying it for a long time. When I first got to Congress, um, when Bill Clinton was president, we balanced the budget for like four years. Um, I apologize. I'm, get, I'm getting over a stomach bug that I picked up uh, on the flight home from an overseas trip. Um, so I'm a little, little under, still a little under the weather today. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I, I just, I, I really feel that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Oh, inflation. Anyway, um, we got to get back to a more fiscally responsible federal budget. Now, and I've had a lot of conversations, and I'm sure there's people on this call who are, you know, mouthing the words modern monetary theory to me, even as I speak, um, about how the deficit doesn't really impact things. But past a certain point, it does. If you are borrowing that much money, if there is so much more money out there in the supply, it's going to drive it up. So we have to try to come up with some sort of sensible fiscal policy. Um, I, I think that does have an impact on inflation. And now part of that for me is a whole succession of tax cuts, particularly for the wealthiest amongst us that were started under George W. Bush and continued under, under Donald Trump. There's a lot of different ways to get to a more fiscally responsible budget, but we're whistling past the graveyard if we think the size of the debt and the size of the deficit have nothing to do with inflation, in, in, in my humble opinion. Well... What's the Democratic Party doing to win this next election? <laughs> oh, you're going you're gonna to get me in trouble here. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and this is not a campaign forum, so I have to be careful about it. But I think there are certain fundamental issues that the Democratic Party needs to better address. I personally have considerable concerns about the way King County is being governed right now um, with regards to law enforcement, uh, public safety issues, um, and a whole series of other issues. I think we've seen an election after election. Um, there are concerns that democratic governance has not adequately dealt with criminal justice, and I'm 100% in favor of criminal justice reform. I am not in favor of defunding the police, and I am not in favor of abolishing jail and punishment. I don't think that's how you get to a safe community. I think we need to have fewer people in jail. I think our reliance on the criminal justice system has been a major problem. Um, you know, I also feel we need to better address the homelessness issue in this, in this county. Um, we do not have an adequate supply of housing. I think there's a laundry list of issues that Democrats can better address in the next four or five months uh, to help help people feel about the party. Um, you know, I guess my simple answer to the question is govern well. Show people that Democrats can govern um, effectively. And then I think we can be successful because, look, I mean, the, well, so I can't get into that. This, this isn't supposed to be a political discussion. Let, let's just suffice to say I have my criticism of, of Donald Trump and the Republican Party as well. You know, I want the Democrats to succeed, but we've got to deal with some issues if we're going to get there. Thank you very much, Congressman. As a reminder to everyone that's listening in, this is a live telephone town hall. If you've got a question you'd like to ask Congressman Smith, all you need to do is press star 3 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Again, press star 3 if you've got a question you'd like to ask live on this call. Moving on, we've got a, uh, a question coming up from Kathy. 
Kathy, you are live on the call. Please go ahead with your question. Good evening. It's good to talk to you. I have to say I've agreed with pretty much everything you've said, which is pretty unusual. Um, but I want to get back to energy. Um, yes. I think that the DOD and private industry will cave to whatever pressure that they can, you know, private industry, it would be dollars. Uh, DOD would be the government. But my question is, is what do we do with, how do we manage or get into the fold? States like Texas and Florida, who have a pretty, you know, hostile uh, view of energy. Yeah, I mean, I would put it slightly differently. Um, I, I think the, the, those states are, are problematic because they they buy into fossil fuels. But first of all, you're talking about states like Texas. They make a ton of money off of fossil fuels. Um, so they, they need to get you know alternative sources of energy. But look, the overall problem here is I think we have to figure out how to pe get people, number one, to accept the premise, and number two, to see that there is – an alternative future that, that can work. And by buy into the premise, I mean buy into the notion that burning fossil fuels is bad for the planet. Now, you know, I've seen the science on climate change. I'm 100% a believer. It's not a simple thing to explain. I know a lot of people act like it is. The simplest thing to explain to me is, you know, just that, well, I just, I was, I was in India. Uh, by the way, that's not the source of my stomach problem. Um, I caught it on the flight home, not in India. But, um, you know, you'd looking at, at Delhi where I was, I mean, it's just pea soup, smog everywhere. Uh, their, they, their energy is primarily coal. If you dig fossil fuels up from the bottom of the ground and burn them, it's bad for the air. It's bad for the water. It's bad for life is the easiest way to put it. And as life, we should be concerned about that. Um, so get them to buy into the premise that, you know, we relying on fossil fuels has a tremendous downside for all of us not just for some. But then second, it, you can't just be a scold about it. You can't then say, therefore, you must do whatever I tell you. You know, how dare you destroy the planet? You're big, evil, awful, and terrible. You know, we are going to force you to bend to our will. It's not that that never works. Um, it's just that that doesn't often work in a representative democracy. You have to try to figure out how to, people, to get people on your side, not to browbeat them into submission. And there's where we make those investments. And, you know, that, that is, you, you've seen what's happened with wind and solar. I mean, 20 years ago, um, wind and solar were kind of an expensive niche item. And I heard a lot of people on the right say, oh, you know, this is nonsense. You know, look at how expensive it is. You're going to generate something. But we made the investments. We made better turbines. We figured out how to manage the wind better. We figured out how to, how to get the solar panels better. And now it is an incredibly cost-effective source of energy. Now, it's still intermittent. Wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, but it has generated a huge source. If we made similar investments in biofuel, in hydrogen, hydrogen has massive potential to be a huge source. We can build that better energy future. But overall, we're locked in this death struggle as a nation right now between the right and the left so that we don't even really listen to each other past a certain point. You get categorized out the door. And if you're a right-wing conservative, you don't listen to anything anyone on the left has to say. And if you're a left-wing liberal, you don't listen to anything anything on the right has to say. We have to meet them halfway and we have to listen. We have to say, okay, what are your concerns? How can we better work with you if we're going to get that support? Because you're exactly right. You know, whatever we do in the state of Washington, uh, which is a more left-leaning state to get there, if half the country isn't with us, um, you know, much less the world, we're not going to get there. We have to dramatically improve our ability to have this conversation in a respectful way to work with people. You know, I, I never understand why it is that, you know, people look at politics and seem to think that calling the people who disagree with them stupid is some sort of path to victory. Um, it's not. You know, if you're going to succeed, you got to get people to come over to your side. You got to have some respect for where they're coming from and you got to have some patience to work with them. And I think it is imperative that we do that because right now, what should be a common sense issue for the future of the planet and the human race has become a partisan theological divide. It should not be. 
we, we've got to work harder to get people uh, over on onto the side of getting us to a clean energy future. Agreed. We need to start. We need to start where we agree and work our way out, as opposed to starting at what we disagree. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, I'd like to borrow everyone that's on the line with us right now to answer a poll question. This is where you have an opportunity by using your telephone keypad to, uh, to rank or vote uh, on a poll question. And here is the question we're looking for your input on. How would you rate the importance of addressing climate change? Use a scale of one to five, with one being not important and five being very important. So again, we're looking for your input now on this poll question, please. How would you rate the importance of addressing climate change? We're using a scale of one to five, one being not important, five being very important. So again, if you're going to rate it and it's of not importance, press the number one key. Kind of important, press the number two key. Of average importance, press the number three key. It's important, press the number four key. And very important, please press the five key. So again, thank you very much. I see that uh, a number of people are taking time to vote. We appreciate your input. And let's go back to live questions. We've got William on the line with us now. William, you're live with Congressman Smith. What is your question? Hello, Congressman. Um, earlier you talked about incentivizing uh, fossil fuel companies to, well, essentially stop being fossil fuel companies. And given the fact that fossil fuel companies have known about uh, climate change since the 1960s and have been one of the driving forces to climate denial and up to now, uh, what do you say to those who don't think it's actually realistic to partner with fossil fuel companies that instead we should nationalize American fossil fuels? Um, well, first of all, we should think of them as energy companies um, and push them to be energy companies. Second of all, I don't think there's any way that you're going to nationalize the industry. That's not what the United States of America does in general. I think it's a huge political lift to get there. And even if you got there, um, I'm not, I'm not, well, I am a democratic socialist. I, I, I believe in the concept of a social welfare state and making sure that you adequately protect people. But socialism in its classic sense of the word is that the government owns the means of production. Um, I don't think that's a particularly efficient way to do it. What I think works best is the government incentivizes certain behavior, makes investments, uh, but then you allow the, the private sector to make investments as well. So I think if we nationalize that that would more likely slow down the overall effort than speed it up. Now, I, you know, it, it's a huge problem and a huge challenge. Look, energy companies have not embraced this and energy companies have not embraced this despite what you see in the BP ads that would make you think that they were all the, the most left-wing environmental organizations you've ever seen in the world. Um, they are still making most of their investments in fossil fuels and they're making insufficient investments in clean burning technologies, no doubt about it. One of the things we can do is support companies that are generating um, alternatives. You know, the, the, we don't need to, and also we should stop whatever subsidies we've given to energy, to fossil fuel companies. And there are still some subsidies out there. Um, and we should subsidize people who do biofuels. We should subsidize people who are looking at new battery technology, people who are working on hydrogen and fusion and nuclear. That's where our economic incentives should go so that we can level that playing field. And yeah, the fossil fuel companies, they, they fight that all the time. And they say, well, it's unfair that you're subsidizing my competitor, which is nonsense because we subsidize them, like I keep saying, for 175 years. So that's where we have to fight that fight. And it's not going to be easy, I'll grant you, but I don't think nationalization would make it any easier. Absolutely. I really appreciate you doing this call. And uh, thank you for supporting nuclear. Thank you. All right, moving on. We've got Rico on the line with us now. Rico, welcome. What is your question? Hi, Congressman. Um, I agree with uh, uh, what I call Plan A, the uh, reduction of fossil fuel burning, you know, both in the United States and around the world to try to get to uh, less carbon pollution. But 
What I see in the United States and and most other parts of the world is that we don't have the political will to carry that out, at least not fast enough to to protect our environment. And I wonder what your thoughts are on uh, progressing, you know, at the same time with a plan B in carbon capture. And while I I like the carbon capture of planting trees and creating forests and, and all that kind of stuff, I'm talking about chemical where basically chemical plants are set up to remove carbon directly from the air and disposing it in a way where it can't be re-emitted to the air. Uh, we've got the state of Washington has a huge scientific community in Tri-Cities that could take the lead on that. Uh, I would hate to see that in 10 years, we haven't made progress on plan A but we haven't invested in plan B as a fallback position to get carbon out of the air while we're, you know, every day emitting more and more into the air instead of reducing it. Yeah. I, the honest answer to that is I do not know enough about carbon capture. I actually, there was a, there's a energy company in Seattle that I worked with a few years ago. Uh, a friend of mine was involved with it that was really focused on carbon capture and, and particularly um, I want to say it was on oil, oil wells in Texas and what can you do to capture the carbon. I don't know enough about it. Um, I don't know if it is a solution. I know one of the criticisms of it that you will traditionally hear from environmentalists is it just incentivizes the generation of fossil fuels. Um, and I know some of the early promise of the idea of um, you could do complete carbon capture on um, fossil fuels didn't really pan out and you probably can't get to that, that zero level. Um, I'm perfectly willing to look at it, um, and make the investments. I think we have to have an, an all of the above approach here in terms of regenerating technologies that will protect us from the effects of burning carbon. And if carbon capture is a technology that can be developed, it can actually work. Sure. I, I've got to educate myself a little bit, bit more about where that technology is at right now. Yeah. Well, I would, I would hope that you would. Uh, I've done, I'm a chemi from the University of Washington, so I know a little bit about the chemical processes that are being used. But, you know, given the way our political situation is, we need to just start extracting carbon from the air. Because I don't think politically we're going to be able to, we're going to do plan A in the next 10 years. It's going to, it's going to take a while. Yeah, another not just in the United States. Not, not just in the United States, but I'm talking about the whole, much of the world. Oh, absolutely. No, the, 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 rec, the record is not good. And it comes back to what we've been talking about throughout much of this call is, you know, when, when people think of energy, they, they think of the cost. That's the first thing they think about. You know, what am I paying at the pump? What am I paying to heat my home? Um, and, you know, if you're coming along with something, and also I will say that, you know, fossil fuel companies do a pretty good job scaring people about that stuff. Um, so yeah, no, we, we've definitely got, got a lot of work to do to get people on board on this. Um, and I think that needs to be, well, I mean, that, that really is kind of plan A. We, we haven't really even, you know, certainly in the U S and some other countries gotten that full scale buy in to the basic premise, the premise being that fossil fuels are destroying the planet and we need to act to preserve the planet. We need to work harder to get people involved. And if carbon capture is one way to get some people interested in the conversation, then I think we should have it. So we had tremendous response to our first poll question, and I'd like people to, uh, to weigh in here on our second poll question of the evening. And you use your telephone keypad to, uh, uh, to register your opinion. The second question is, how would you rate Congressman Smith's performance on environmental and climate issues? Again, we're using a scale of one to five, one being very poor and five being very good. And if you have no opinion, you can use the zero key. So again, how would you rate Congressman Smith's performance on environmental and climate issues? We're using the scale of one to five, one being very poor and five being very good. And if you have no opinion, you can use the zero key. So again, no opinion, you press zero, very poor, one, somewhat poor, two, somewhat good, three, good performance, four, very good performance, five. 
I see the, uh, the numbers are growing. Thank you very much for participating. And let's get back to the phones and get another call in. We've got Rick on the line with us now. Rick, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Great. Thank you for uh, taking the call. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you loud and clear. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in the shift to uh, battery electric vehicles, um, I'm interested in where we find the rare earth elements to support this massive shift. I'm familiar with the industry working for a major um, trucking company, a manufacturing company in the Bellevue area. And um, most of those rare earths come from China. So I'd like your input uh, on that topic. Absolutely. And um, connected to that question um, is the issue of if you find the rare earths, where do you process them to get to the product that you ultimately need? That's the biggest problem right now. I was asked this part of my trip that I was just on. I was in Australia before I went to India, and that's all. We spent a lot of time in, in Australia talking about um, well, the pressure that China was exerting on them in general, but about rare earth minerals in, in, in general. And Australia generates a ton of rare earth minerals. They don't process any of them. That's what has, has been being done primarily in China. It is expanding out to other places. Um, you know, we have got to dramatically expand our processing capability and not be completely reliant on China to do it. Now, I happen to think that we can do that because what happened with China was, you know, late 90s into the turn of the 21st century, China became the go-to place for, a, you know, for, for cheap manufacturing, for lack of a better way to put it. You know, they were you know, 1.4 billion people. They made massive investments. Um, we incentivized it so companies all over the world look to China as a cheap place to do business, also a cheap way to get access to a massive market of 1.4 billion people. Um, and it became where we did that. Now, what we've learned since the pandemic in the last few years, that sadly, President Xi in China has chosen to be vastly more belligerent in the way he interacts with the rest of the world um, and is you know, not a reliable partner. But there are other places that can do that type of processing. We just need to make the investment. There's a ton of countries throughout Asia, a ton of countries in Latin America, um, where you can do that processing for an affordable rate so that we're not reliant upon China. But that's part of the whole comprehensive picture. And you know, I don't, I haven't sat down, sat down and written it all out. But when you look, okay, what do we need to make this happen? You know, I mean, that's the way you solve problems. You set the goal, and then you say, how do we get there? And then you find what the blocks on that path are. And we've identified a number of them in this conversation here, and I think you, you brought up a, a crucial one on rare earths. Uh, we've got to be able to generate them. I'm sorry, not generate them. We've got to be able to mine them, and then we've got to be able to process them. And right now, we don't have sufficient global capability to do that. And then when you look at some of the other sources of rare earths, Africa is a huge source. Um, both China and Russia right now are basically using very aggressive tactics uh, to gain control of those rare earth minerals in Africa, um, but basically they're, you know, in many cases, bribing local officials, you know, providing security for them, providing money to develop projects in exchange for guaranteed portions of it. And right now, we cannot trust Russia and China to have the best interests of the globe at heart. So we need to develop alternatives. Thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, moving along, uh, we've, we've had tremendous uh, response from people with the poll questions, so thank you very much for uh, taking a moment to, uh, to key in uh, your, uh, your opinions. It's very important uh, for the Congressman and, and moving forward. Uh, we've got a third poll question that I'd like to call on everyone to, uh, uh, to give us their opinion on. And the question is, what is the top environmental issues uh, that Congressman Smith should be focused on? Environmental justice, press one. Pollution and air quality, please press two. Preserving public lands, press three. Reducing dependence on fossil fuels, four. Protecting wildlife, five. So again, what is the top environmental issues that Congressman Smith should be focused on? Environmental justice, press one. Pollution and air quality, press 2. 
preserving public lands, three, reducing dependence on fossil fuels, four, protecting wildlife, press five. See the numbers are growing. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, taking a quick look at the clock, Congressman, I think I'd like to call on you now to, uh, uh, to provide any closing remarks you may have, sir. Certainly. Well, first of all, let me say this was an incredibly encouraging conversation. I mean, the, the questions and the ideas were very thoughtful and focused in the right direction, which is how do we solve this problem? Um, I mean, so much of political discourse today, as I've mentioned a couple of times during the call, is just sort of about yelling at each other about who's right and who's wrong. And that's just not the way I view politics. To me, politics is supposed to be about bringing diverse groups of people together to try and solve problems. And you don't get much bigger a problem uh, than trying to figure out how to preserve the planet, how to protect our environment, and in particular, how to chart an energy future where we can meet our energy needs and protect the planet. And again, I, I'm optimistic about this. I have seen the technological advancements, and I'm, I'm blessed to have lived when, I live, when, I, when I've lived. You know, 56 years in this earth, I've seen some incredible developments in technology, problems solved that would have been unimaginable when I was born. Um, we've made the investments, we've made the breakthroughs, we've made the advancements to dramatically improve all manner of different things that we, we, we face in this, in, in this world. We can do this. Don't have any doubt about it. But we've got to make the investment. We've got to make the commitment. And I think crucially, as, as I hope we, we heard in this discussion tonight, we have to have a discussion about it. We have to work through it in, in, in a problem-solving, logical way, bringing all of resources to bear to get to the right answer, not from a predetermined ideological conclusion where we want to show that we know more than the person we're talking to. We've got to learn together, get to the right answers, and solve the problem. It's you know, the most crucial problem that we face as, as a people and as a planet. So I look forward to continuing to work with you, and um, you, uh, you make me feel better about democracy this evening. So I appreciate the conversation, the way it was handled, and I, I welcome your ideas. I know running across the bottom of our screen here is the information on how to contact my office. Um, please do not hesitate to use that and, and let me know how we can be helpful, um, what issues we can work on, certainly on the environment, but on anything else as well. I always say the single most important thing I do as a member of Congress is represent the people of my district. I am your voice uh, in Washington, D.C. I can only be effective if I hear from you, know what you're concerned about, and get in the best position possible to be helpful. So thank you. Appreciate the conversation. Look forward to continuing it. And uh, thank the moderator. Um, and I thank my staff for organizing this call. Thank you, sir. And a hearty thank you to everyone for participating in today's town hall. And thank you, Congressman Smith, for hosting this event. Now, for everyone on the call, if you have additional inquiries or if we didn't have time to get to your question, please reach out to Congressman Smith's office using his website, adamsmith.house.gov forward slash contact. Also, at the very end of this call, if you'd like to leave your name and email address, you'll be added to the Congressman's e-newsletter. So you can do that uh, by leaving a voicemail at the end of this call. Again, your name and email address, and you'll be added to the Congressman's e-newsletter. Thank you again for taking the time to be a part of this live telephone town hall. We hope you have a great rest of your evening. This concludes this town hall.